Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Join host Sanjay Puri as he explores the dynamic and developing world of artificial intelligence governance. Each episode features deep dives with global leaders at the forefront of regulating AI responsibly, tackling the challenges using AI can bring about head on and enabling balance without hindering innovation. Welcome to the Regulating AI podcast. Artificial intelligence AI stands at the forefront of technological evolution, with experts predicting that it could add trillions of dollars to our GDP, but it could also negatively impact our workforce and national security. So how do we regulate it without stifling innovation? Let's find out by talking to some experts. And we talk to people from industry, government officials, and advocacy groups so that they can address pivotal questions that are needed to create practical legislation. I'm very excited to have Congressman Jay Overnauti with us today. He represents California's 23rd District in the House of Representatives. He's also the Vice Chair of the Congressional AI Caucus. I invited him on this show as he's one of the few members of Congress who's an actual expert in AI. He has a graduate degree in AI from UCLA, an undergrad in engineering from Caltech, but he's also been a successful entrepreneur. Welcome, Congressman. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Regulating AI podcast. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Great. Congressman, let's start with the executive order that President Biden issued on October 30th. Can you give us your views and thoughts about this EO? Uh, Well, I think it's kind of a mixed bag, in my opinion. On the one hand, I think it's very helpful that the president is taking an active role in establishing a regulatory framework for AI. I think it's very appropriate that the executive branch weigh in on actions that the administration and all the federal agencies can take in enhancing our national security and preparing these agencies for the advent of advanced AI. However, I think that the executive order also overreaches in several important areas. It's not within the power of the executive branch to set regulation on private industry. That prerogative is reserved for Congress, the nation's legislature. So the fact that the administration is attempting to invoke the Defense Production Act to impose a regulatory framework on private industry when it comes to artificial intelligence, I think that's an overreach and is inappropriate. And I think from a constitutional standpoint, would almost certainly not stand up to legal scrutiny. So it's unhelpful in that sense as well, because we're trying to provide some surety to the various companies that are at the forefront of developing these frontier models. And as you know, developing the models is unbelievably expensive. Chat GPT were required an investment of over $100 million, and subsequent iterations will be even higher. So mm-hmm. no one is going to make that kind of investment without some certainty that there's going to be commercial application for the software that they're creating. And I think that invoking the DPA just muddies the waters when it comes to that kind of regulatory certainty. So, uh, you know, that I think was not as helpful, but hopefully it galvanizes us here in Congress to finish our work of creating a regulatory framework for all of artificial intelligence that we can pass and hopefully the administration will agree to, and we can solve the problem collaboratively. Congressman, just for our audience, for people to understand, when he talks about certainty, because executive orders, Congressman, can be reversed also by a different administration or by the same administration, and that's what I think you are talking about, certainty with such large investments, foundation models, et cetera. Well, in addition to that, which I think is an excellent point, is if there's legal uncertainty. For example, my opinion, not as a lawyer, I'm a computer scientist, but Mm -hmm. my opinion is that a plain reading of the Defense Production Act leads me to believe this is not a legal application of it. So I'm sure that it would be challenged if the administration attempted to impose it. And while that court case was being decided, there would also exist a legal uncertainty, which I don't think is helpful to anyone. Yeah. So speaking about the role of Congress, Congressman, you have tabled the CREATE AI Act. Can you let our listeners know what is this about? Certainly. One of my big concerns about the development and deployment of artificial intelligence is the concern that it will 
be developed by only a few companies. We have had in the United States a long and productive history where cutting edge research is predominantly performed in our academic institutions, particularly with research with respect to basic sciences. And that research is done in a very open and transparent way. We have a rich tradition of publication. If you make a grant, an earth shaking discovery that's published, it's written up. And we have a tradition of peer review where your peers at other institutions attempt to recreate the research that you've done to validate it or to contradict it or to advance it. This is a system that served us well for hundreds of years. We are in danger of seeding the research into advanced artificial intelligence to just the few companies that have access to the capital and the resources necessary to train these frontier models. And I think that that would be very unhealthy. So we want to make sure that our academic institutions still have access to those resources. And that's what this bill is all about. It establishes the National AI Research Resource, a pool of shared resource that can be requested by academic institutions for the continuing research into advanced AI. And I think that will put them at parity with the corporations that are doing that research and continue the tradition that we have of that research being done in an academic setting. Some of it was touched on by the EO also, right? Your bill was actually given pretty good visibility in the executive order. Yes, I think that we're in furious agreement on most of the provisions of the bill. And that's why I am so optimistic that this bill will be passed by the House and the Senate and eventually become law. Congressman, in your explanation, you touched on something which is a little bit of a concern, especially for upcoming entrepreneurs, which is you talked about a few companies. As you know, some of these companies, the large ones, have come up to Congress and raised their hands and said, regulate us, regulate us. So people are talking about, use the word regulatory capture, basically saying, create a regulation and then let's keep, take the ladder away from there. Is that also, is that what kind of also what you're also talking about, Congressman? Well, if that's not a part of this bill, but we have a task force here in the House of Representatives that is dedicated to creating a regulatory framework for AI within the House. And I've been asked to be the chairman of that task force. And so we are hard at work at accomplishing that task. And I think when industry comes to us and say, please regulate us, I don't think anyone believes that an industry really wants government intervention, right? But I think that everyone accepts, everyone, meaning mm -hmm. industry and the general populace, everyone accepts that government will have a role in creating this regulation. So when you hear industry say that, I think what they are really saying is, would you please, we know you're going to regulate us eventually. Would you please get going and do that so that we know what the rules are? Because we can change the world if we know what the rules are. But if you leave us in uncertainty, we're not going to be able to make the investment necessary to do that. You talked about uncertainty a lot, which is a great point. But as an AI expert, you know the technology is evolving dramatically. Just from the time the large language models were released, you got multimodal. People are talking that we could be very close to AGI. How is policy or how is Washington and folks like you going to keep pace? Because we don't know really what the future is going to be. So, Congressman, thoughts on that? Certainly. Well, I think it's an excellent point. And that is why in crafting regulation, I've always been a strong advocate for not focusing on the specifics of technology. Instead, I think we need to focus on outcomes and regulate those outcomes, make it clear what the boundaries are, what's a legal activity, what's an illegal activity. And in that way, the technology can adapt. And what mm -hmm. I let me give you a specific example. So there has been a lot of controversy over the use of AI to make automated decisions in hiring. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's controversial, in addition to being a use context that is incredibly impactful on real people, it's also something that's rife for the introduction of bias. And there have been documented cases now where biases have been proven to exist. So this is a great example of what we're talking about, because it is already illegal to discriminate against someone when hiring based on Correct. a laundry list of different characteristics, the, their ethnicity, their sexual mm -hmm. orientation, right? It's already mm -hmm. illegal. And it doesn't matter what tool you use to accomplish that discrimination. If it's someone, if it's a human that discards a resume because it's from an ethnic group that they have a bias against, or if it's an AI algorithm that accomplishes the same thing, it's still illegal. So the point I'm making is we don't have to craft guardrails around 
the use of AI in that specific situation because it is already illegal. We don't have to say it's only illegal if you know there's a certain amount of computation was involved in making the decision or if there's a certain number of weights in the model or if a certain technology was used to make it. It is already illegal. So the action, you govern the outcome, you don't govern the tool that's used to use it. And that way, if the tool changes, you don't have to pivot so quickly. So for our listeners, what you're saying is we have the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, we have the DOJ, we have the FTC, and there are many rules already governing a lot of these things. So we don't have to, we need to regulate the outcomes rather than the weights and all those other things, right, Congressman? Yes, absolutely. And also this fits into a larger issue of how we architect a regulatory framework for AI. There are a couple of different competing schools of thought on this. The question is, do you do as the European Union has proposed to do and create a brand new bureaucracy for the regulation of AI and every use of AI in anything but a low risk context must apply to that agency for a license to be able to operate? Or do you empower our existing sectoral regulators like the EEOC, like the FDA, like the FAA, who are already having to deal with the advent of AI in their sectoral spaces? Do you empower them with the resources that they need? And I think it's pretty clearly the latter, because I was astonished to discover in a health subcommittee hearing a couple of weeks ago that the FDA has already processed over 500 applications for the use of AI in medical devices. Yes. And over 200 of those are already on shelves. So the question is, is it easier to teach the FDA what it doesn't know about AI? Or is it easier to teach a brand new agency everything the FDA already knows about patient safety? If you think about it that way, I think it's pretty clear that it's easier to empower the FDA to make those decisions within the context of AI's use in medical devices and in within their sectoral space. Yeah, so what you're saying is we don't really need another bureaucracy to be brought up in Washington from that perspective, which some of some members of Congress have talked about. Congressman, shifting topics a little bit with your AI background and as an entrepreneur, who do you think should be liable if an AI system causes harm? The developer of the system, the deployer, or the user, or all of them? Right. I think it's a very important question. And it's a question that is really murky when you think about all of the different inputs that go into making an AI algorithm that's custom fitted for a given use. So the, the commercial space that's emerging is we have these large language models that mm -hmm. underpin most cutting edge AI. And then on top of that, so that's done by the developer. Yeah. And then what you have is you have these deployers that license that technology and customize that mm -hmm. the use of the large language model for their a specific intended use. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not really clear if the AI causes harm, who's to blame for that, you know, for that situation. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it's going to have to be parceled out between them. But I also want to make the point that I think it is really harmful for us as a society to assume everything that goes wrong has to be someone's fault. It's in a way, and that's where we've gotten to is the degree of litigiousness in our society has increased. We've gotten to the space where something bad happens and everyone goes to court and blame is apportioned. And, you know, if you get into a car accident, well, it might be 51% the driver's fault, but it's 23% the other person's fault and 18% the car manufacturer's fault because the car could have made to be safer. But because the car manufacturer has the deepest pockets, they're the ones that end up paying the settlement. I think that would be a very dangerous place to get into when it comes to AI because that system imposes costs. And AI has the potential, as you mentioned in your opening, to be a revolutionary transformative technology that really takes our economy to a next level where people are more empowered at everything they do. And that's mm -hmm. going to drive down costs to consumers. It's counterproductive, though, to create a legal environment that encourages people to sue the deep pockets, you know, whoever those deep pockets might be. Those costs are inevitably going to be passed on to consumers, and it's going to lessen the positive impacts that AI can have. So I think we need to take a really rational approach to apportioning liability. That's a good point. Congressman, there's a big debate going on, which you are very familiar, on open sourcing. Whether you've seen Meta has open source Llama 2, and there are other open sources. Now, some companies say, hey, it's very dangerous, etc. Where do you come out on this debate, open source or not to open source? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this is an issue that we have been 
discussing in Congress and specifically in the House task force on AI regulation. We had the president of the Hugging Face come in and give us a briefing because they are big believers in open source. But mm -hmm. I've also met with a number of people who have national security concerns about open source because mm -hmm. the argument is that if something is open source, even if safety mechanisms have been baked into it, open source makes it easier to remove those safeguards. And someone might use advanced AI for a malicious purpose, such as making a biological weapon, for example. So, you know, that's the basic tension between those two ideas. My own personal opinion is I think both of them have use cases, and I think both should be allowed. I mean, there's going to be guardrails that we have to set around any use of AI. And I think it doesn't, again, if you regulate the tool and not the technology, you know, you regulate the outcome and not the technology used to create it, that where those guardrails are becomes plain. And within that, then people can do what they need to do. So I think that there'll be you'll see frontier models that are open source. And I think you'll see frontier models that are proprietary. And I think that our commercial and regulatory landscape should be comprehensive enough to deal with both of those. I know you mentioned you're not a lawyer, but just to ask a question, should companies have a legal right to disclose when they're using AI? You mean a legal requirement? Requirement to disclose okay. if they're using AI? Well, I mean, it gets into the discussion of one of what I feel is the most dangerous misuses of AI, which is the spread of mis- and disinformation. And when you don't disclose when AI has been used, for example, in the case of generative AI, if you have an image or a video and there's no disclosure on there that's been generated by AI, people might reasonably look at it and assume that it's real. And that can have some really negative consequences for society. So our, the question is, what do we do to prevent that? And it has been suggested that, for example, there, as you say, there should have to be disclosure when something's generated by AI. Some people have suggested watermarking, Tory watermarking for AI-generated content might be a good idea. I actually take the opposite point of view because I think, I mean, if you're a forward thinker and you think not a year in the future, but 50 years in the future, what's our world going to look like? I think generative AI at that point will be so advanced. If someone who wanted to type into a prompt, make me a video of CNN anchors discussing the arrest of Congressman Jay Obernolte with security camera footage from the night before. And it could generate it in the time it took me to type that, right? So, you know, I, as Congressman Obernolte, might justifiably be concerned about people viewing that and assuming it was real. You know, but however, when it's that easy... If you made a rule that had to be watermarked, that would work for all of the content made by people who follow the rules, but there would still be content made by people that don't follow the rules, and the public will be desensitized by the fact that most content has the watermark, right? So I think yeah. the opposite. I think that people are going to naturally adopt encrypted watermarks. That's not something you can see. It's something that is blockchain-enabled right. that, that encrypts a, a piece that and verifies it, its uh, authenticity. You'll see like security camera footage that's watermarked to prove that it's legitimate came from a camera. You'll see CNN watermarking all of their broadcasts Podcast. so that when someone sees a CNN broadcast, you can verify that it's authentic. And so that's what I think watermarking is going to be used for, to prove not the fact that something's AI generated, but instead to prove the provenance of something that's authentic. Congressman, this is a topic you and I have discussed before. When I look at all the experts that come in, you talked about Hugging Face and others. It's generally these big tech companies, Stanford, Cambridge, and Carnegie Mellon and others, and they're fantastic institutions. But should we not get the voices of small businesses, manufacturing companies, community colleges into this discussion? Because they're going to be impacted too, don't you think? Because this is what our mission is, bringing all kinds of voices to the table here. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. We need to make sure that the decisions that we as a society make about the regulation and governments of artificial intelligence are legitimate. And I mean that in a public administration sense and a government sense. Legitimate decisions are ones that everyone feels like they had a voice in. And whether or not they agree with them, they recognize that the good of the people was the goal in crafting the regulation. And that's what we're going to need around our regulatory framework. So that means that all voices need to be listened to. And that's something that we have been doing on the task force is meeting with people from a wide variety of different backgrounds, not just people from industry, not just people from academia, but people with national security backgrounds, people from federal agencies, uh, ethicists, because I think that's very important. People have done the deep thinking about what's ethical and what's not. Uh, futurists, people that are mm -hmm. thinking and talking about maybe existential threats caused by AI, not within a year or two, but within 10 or 20 or 50 years. 
But I think all of these voices are important. Congressman, should AI regulations be regional or should they be global in your view? Well, I think they should be as comprehensive as we can make them. We have a problem where we certainly don't want to cede our authority over the regulation of AI to the UN or the WTO or the EU. You know, it's important that those decisions be made federally. However, we have a, also a system of federalism where we cede some of the federal government's authority to the states. And so that's a very, very hot topic for us is, should we allow the states to innovate on this mm -hmm. issue as they have done in digital data privacy? Or mm -hmm. should we preempt this issue and deal with, adopt a comprehensive federal standard? And I think that the federal standard is the way to go. I think that the constitution sets a clear requirement on us that Congress be the authority in regulating interstate commerce. And AI is obviously so related to interstate commerce that I don't see how we can allow a patchwork of 50 different state regulations to exist. And if you look at the danger of doing that, if you want a perfect example, digital data privacy is a great example where Congress failed to act on that. And now we've got 23 different state regulations that have sprung up. Yeah. And it's very difficult to comply with 23 different sets of rules. And the only people that have the legal complexity to comply with a landscape that complex are the big companies, the companies yeah. that have a whole building full of lawyers. And you know, the people that struggle to comply with it are entrepreneurs. If you're trying to start a company with two guys out of a basement, the yeah. way that Apple was started, the way that HP was started, the way that Facebook mm -hmm. was started, how can you deal with 23 different state regulations? No. And so we can't allow that to continue with AI. We need to make sure we adopt one federal standard and have that apply to everybody. Final question. I'm going to ask you to look at your crystal ball. By when do you think we will have some kind of legislation on AI in Congress, Congressman? Oh, well, some sort of legislation we already have. I think we've got... Oh, uh, yeah, but, but yeah, I know. Uh, but but Chuck Schumer like, is uh, working towards yeah. a comprehensive... Senator sure. Chuck Schumer is working. Will we have a comprehensive AI regulation in your view? Yes, I think we will. However, I think it's important to note mm -hmm. that the solution to crafting a regulatory framework around AI will likely be an incremental one. Now, we have some near-term, we need to be self-aware when we ask ourselves the question, why are we regulating? And the answer is we regulate because we want to prevent consumer harms. And only when we know what those harms are can we craft a regulatory framework that guards against those harms. In the case of AI, we have some near-term negative consequences that are already foreseeable that we can guard against. That's AI's ability to pierce through digital data privacy, AI's ability to introduce bias into important human decisions, AI's potential for the spread of mis and disinformation. Those are all near-term harms. Right. And we know we're going to have to create legislation that addresses those. But I think that there are medium-term and longer-term harms that are not in focus enough for us to be able to craft legislation around them. And so I think that what you will see, particularly if we adopt the sectoral approach that we were discussing earlier, yeah. I think what you will see is not one big comprehensive AI bill that passes now, but a series of bills, a few bills every year that pass, you know, every year. So we incrementally hone in on the ultimate regulatory framework. I think that's probably much more likely. An incremental approach is what you're saying, so. Yes. Wonderful. Congressman, thank you so much. This was very enlightening and very, very helpful. And thanks for what you're doing in Congress. We need more people like you. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Regulating AI Innovate Responsibly podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to any resources mentioned on the show. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe so you'll never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review.